Hello everybody and welcome to part four. So now we're actually going to be moving on to the cells. So we're going to be talking about cells for the next couple chapters, but it's really, really important that you guys get the fundamentals about cells done right away. So really like pay attention to what we're doing because we're going to see all of these concepts again and again and again throughout the semester. So again, it's really, really important that you're paying attention the whole time. Obviously, this isn't just kind of like a learn one thing temporarily or memorize just for a second, but we're actually trying to actively learn throughout the semester and keep that memorization, you know, like keep that information solidified, not just a temporary memorization, but really learning and understanding the, the concepts that we're going to be talking about. All right, with that said, let's go ahead and get started with um, the cells. So we are going to be talking about several different types of cells today. Uh, and we're going to be talking about really small things. So I know this is kind of contextually hard to kind of wrap around, especially a lot of people because they can't see the cells and therefore they, they don't really understand what's going on. They think that we're one giant cell and you know our brain is our nucleus and that's not what's going on. We are made up of millions and millions and millions of cells. In fact, all animals are multicellular and that's what we are. We're a type of animal and therefore we are multicellular. So that's the kind of cells that we're going to be learning about today as well as plant cells, prokaryotic cells, all sorts of different stuff like that. All right, so we're going to be actually looking at this chart to look at the size relative to other things of how big these cells are. So everything right here in this light blue section is what you can see with the naked eye, meaning that's just something that you're looking at with your eyeball. That's what's considered the naked eye, if you've ever heard that before. Okay, so in this, basically this area goes right here. We go from things that are 10 meters and larger. Obviously, we can see things that are larger than 10 meters um, all the way down to here to like things like frog's eggs. So frog's eggs are actually pretty small, but they're still not small enough that we can't see them with our naked eye. Okay, once you actually get down below this millimeter, and when we're in the lab, and I know this is going to kind of be difficult here, but if you picture a millimeter, if you look at the opposite side of your centimeter, sorry, if you if look at the opposite side of your ruler, you see inches, right? That's one side. That's known as the imperial side. We're, that's the one we use. But everybody else in the world uses metric. So flip that ruler over, and then you see centimeters. Okay, those are metric, right? If you look at every tiny little individual line in between each centimeter, that's a millimeter. That's how small a millimeter is. So yes, we can see a millimeter with our bare, with our naked eye, but things that are even smaller than that, when we get to like nanometers and picometers, we can't see with our naked eye. And that's what you can see right here. And that's what we would need an actual light microscope for. And that's what would be we would be using if we were in class or if we are in lab, if we actually get to. Um, Probably not, but we'll see. Um, that's what you'd actually be looking at with a light microscope, also known as a compound microscope. Now, this is going to be pretty much all of the plant animal cells that we know about and that we can see, and we can actually even see things inside these plants and animal cells like organelles. Remember those tiny little organ-like structures that are inside the cells? We can actually see those with the use of a light microscope. Now, the smallest bacteria is actually really hard to see with a light microscope or compound microscope. So that's what you'd actually have to get really fancy and start using an electron microscope. Now, we're not going to use an electron microscope in class because we just don't have one. And they're really expensive. And, you know, for looking at things that are really, really tiny, not something that you guys need to, to worry about. So we're just focusing always on the light microscope or what's also known as a compound microscope. Now, here's something that you absolutely will need to know because we will talk about this over and over and over again in our semester, is the difference between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Now, prokaryotic cells are things like bacteria. Eukaryotic cells are things like everything else. I say this, and I say this with this tone because I will ask you the question, what's the differences between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells? And some of you are gonna say plants and animals, and that's totally wrong. Prokaryotic cells, the name prokaryote, pro means before, karyote means nucleus or kernel. Okay, so these do not have a nucleus before the nucleus. They do not have a true nucleus. All plant cells, animal cells, funguses, everything else besides simple bacteria, right, are going to be eukaryotic cells. So all eukaryotic cells have nucleuses. They have what's called membrane-bound organelles, and that just means those little tiny organelles bound inside of us covered in a membrane, that's all that means. But prokaryotic cells don't have that. The nucleus is a membrane-bound organelles. Prokaryotic cells don't have it, which means eukaryotic cells are going to have it. Um, so that kind of helps you remember that. Now, the difference also between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells is prokaryotic cells 
are very small, very small and very simple. Well, let's click back real quick to this chart. Plants and animal cells, right? They range between 10 micrometers and 100 micrometers. Bacterias are all the way pretty much down here. I mean, most bacteria are going to be found here, but again, still smaller, smaller than the actual um, eukaryotic cells. In fact, mitochondria and the nucleus, right, are, well, the mitochondria we're going to learn about in just a second. Wow, well, I don't want to spoil it. I'm not going to spoil it, so I'm going to get there. But let's just say that things like mitochondria and bacteria, like prokaryotes, are really tiny, whereas animal cells and plant cells have those mitochondria inside of them, so obviously they would have to be much bigger. And I'll just leave it at that until I actually get to the other top that I, part that I want to tell you about. All right, so prokaryotic cells, small, simple, usually some kind of geometric shape like this one, small circle, small rod, sometimes a spiral. Um, we're going to learn about all these in our lab classes, so make sure that you guys are paying attention to the shapes of these bacteria, these prokaryotic cells. Um, they do not have organelles, all right, no membrane-bound organelles. They do have some of the things that are also found in eukaryotic cells, but they have less than eukaryotic cells would have. So, well, again, prokaryotic cells would be things like bacteria and uh, archaea. Okay, so usually bacteria and archaea are kind of lumped to those prokaryotic cells. Archaea is kind of different, though. Archaea is not exactly going to be a prokaryote. It's not a bacteria for sure, and that's because it does have some kind of eukaryotic property. So we're going to talk about archaea later on in the semester. But just know that, again, always, always, always bacteria are going to be prokaryotes. Whereas plant cells, animal cells, funguses, pretty much everything else are going to be eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells, you means true. Nucleus, uh, karyote means again nucleus. So this is the true nucleus. So all of your eukaryotic cells are going to have a true nucleus. Um, they're going to be much larger. They're going to be much more complex. This makes sense because they have organelles. If they have a bunch of organelles inside of them, obviously those organelles are going to have special little functions and therefore they're going to be much more complicated than something that doesn't have those organelles, like a prokaryotic cell. So smaller, simpler, they, uh, sorry, prokaryotic cells, smaller, simpler, no membrane-bound organelles, eukaryotic cells, larger, more complex, does have uh, membrane-bound organelles like the nucleus, like the mitochondria, stuff like that. Um, and it's going to, again, be plants, animals, and um, funguses and stuff. And when I say plants, animals, and funguses, right, a plant is not a giant cell. A plant is made up of plant cells. So that cactus is made up of many, many, many plant cells. It's not one giant cell. i got to clarify that. All right, moving on. Here is what a, um, basically a picture of a bacteria looks like. So you can see right here we have this rod shape with some flagella coming off the side or the end. Again, we have this rod shape. It's kind of bent and wonky. He's fallen over, right, with these flagella coming off the edges right here. Now, some of the structures you will need to know, especially when we get to these plants and animal cells, for sure, for sure, for sure, you will need to know all of these organelles inside of them and what they're doing. Yes, you will need to identify them and be able to tell me what they're doing. So let's start with a very simple one. Let's start with the prokaryotic cells. So what we can see right here is, yes, we do have flagella that are coming off the end. The flagella are basically used as kind of like a whip-like tail to propel you forward. So this is how they move around. Now, on the outside of this, they have what's called a capsule. This is basically a little protective casing. But on the inside of that, they have a cell wall. Now, this is actually kind of unique because the only other cell that has a cell wall are plant cells. So in this case, bacteria and plant cells have something in common because these prokaryotic cells and these plant cells have a cell wall. Animal cells, I can tell you, do not. So that's something the plant cells and prokaryotes do, but animals do not. Now, what animals do have is a plasma membrane. So do these guys, and so do plant cells. This plasma membrane is something that we kind of already talked about last week when we were talking about um, the, the membranes. Remember, the membrane is all made up of those lipids, right? That phospholipid bilayer, bi meaning two, and a phospholipid, just one little phospholipid, right? And they have the two layers, right? with the, um, the hydrophilic heads that love water and the hydrophobic tails that hate water, so they all line up. Tails on the inside, heads on the outside. There it is. Tails on the inside, heads on the outside. They create that membrane. So that membrane is what we're talking about when we say a membrane-bound organelle. So the plasma membrane, sometimes also called the cell membrane, um, pretty much the same thing, that is used to kind of maintain what's inside the cell as well as keeping things out. So it's kind of that protective barrier. We're keeping what we need in and we're keeping what we need to stay out, out. Okay, so very important. 
um, for all cells. So prokaryotic cells, plant cells, animal cells, they all have these um, plasma membranes. All right, next up are ribosomes. So ribosomes, we've kind of touched on already about how they actually are the site of protein synthesis. So they are the site where proteins get made. And so they have to have ribosomes because most of them are proteins, right? Just like us. Structurally, they're probably mostly proteins. And therefore, if you're not going to be, you know, a phospholipid membrane layer, you have to have those proteins. Where are you going to get the proteins? You got to have ribosomes. Ribosomes are going to make said protein. So very important to have these ribosomes. So yes, all prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells do have these ribosomes. Um, what else? Let's, so that's pretty much what we've been talking about, the differences between the two and some of the similarities. So they both have plasma membranes. Yes, they do. They both have ribosomes, even though they're structured just a little bit different. You guys don't need to concern yourself with that. You just need to know that yes, they both do have ribosomes. Um, what else? The prokaryotic cells were the first on the planet Right? So life started in the ocean with some prokaryotic cells. Simple, you know, bacteria type organisms crawling around, swimming around their little flagella, right? And they lived, um, it was about 3.5 billion years ago. So a long, long time ago. In fact, I don't think we even got uh, eukaryotic cells until about 2.1 billion years ago. So really for like a billion and a half years, it was just prokaryotes who took over planet Earth and were happy and thriving. In fact, fun fact, the first mass extinction of organisms on the planet, and there's been six, well, we believe we're in the six right now. Yay, humans. Thanks for that one. But the very first one was actually a die-off of these prokaryotic cells. Because early on, there was not oxygen on our planet, and therefore, a lot of these organisms didn't like oxygen, didn't need it, didn't want it, wanted nothing to do with it. So in the great oxygenation event, where these little microscopic photosynthetic bacteria started actually producing enough oxygen. So now that there was oxygen in the atmosphere, the first thing to go, the mass extinction, prokaryotes, right? So then we wiped out a bunch of the prokaryotes, huge mass extinction, the whatever prokaryotes were left eventually started to evolve, evolve, evolve to get to actually become eukaryotes. So now we have prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Yay for us, because we wouldn't be here without that. Thank you, early prokaryotes. I appreciate you. All right, so again, this is a really great little um, diagram right here of the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotic cells if you want to take a look at this for your study, which you should. Now, moving on to our eukaryotic cells, we have our animal cells here and our plant cells right here. I can tell it's an animal cell because it's kind of round and it's kind of squishy because it has no cell wall. You know who does have a cell wall? This plant cell right here. And I can tell because look, see that geometric angle right there? It's literally like, I don't know, it's a hundred and... It's so a 90, I don't know, like 105 degrees, right? It's a geometric angle, pew, 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 right? That does not happen in animal cells ever. So if you were to poke a tree, it would not go like this, squish, squish, squish. We are squishy because we do not have cell walls. You poke that tree, it's not going to be squishy because all of their cells are covered in that cell wall. That cell wall is used for structure. So it gives them that rigidity. It also gives them angles, right? You won't see angles in a... Um, in a animal cell. So again, animal cell, plant cells, both eukaryotic cells. So don't give me prokaryotic cells have cell walls. Well, they do. But they also are their plant cells. No, they're both eukaryotic cells. Okay. Um, we are going to go through each one of these. Now, I did mention that, yes, you have to be able to identify them. So these two pictures right here, I would study. Study, study, study these two pictures right here. Because again, you need to know what some of these things look like. So I'm gonna take you guys through each one of these organelles on the inside of these animal and plant cells and we're gonna talk about their function. So yes, you need to know the function. You also need to be able to identify them. So make sure that you guys are paying attention for that. Before we get to that, we're gonna talk briefly about the plasma membrane. Remember that the plasma membrane, the plasma membrane is made out of these phospholipids. This right here is a phospholipid. So you can see the little hydrophilic head right here, the hydrophobic tails down here. And when they get together, they form this bilayer. Because again, the tails don't like water. They're like, oh, we're surrounded by all this water. Oh, wait, wait. Now we block off the water. Okay, so these are the heads up here. These are the tails down here. They're essentially creating this membrane, which you can see right here. Okay, so we see this inner layer. That would be the inside of the cell. We see this outer layer that would be extracellular or on the outside of the cell. And that would just be inside of our body. 
Now inside of our body is mostly liquid or bathed in some kind of liquid. And therefore, these hydrophilic heads are good because they're surrounded by liquid. Inside the cell is also mostly liquid. So these hydrophilic heads on the inside are good. The tails have now made this little protective area so that the tails are all protected from the water. They never see any water and they're good too. So again, this is how we make this phospholipid bilayer, which is really important because this makes our membranes. Our membranes prevent things from exiting the cells that we don't want necessarily to leave our cells, and they prevent things from coming into the cells that we maybe don't want in our cells. So very, very important, these phospholipid bilayers. All right, and that's exactly what we can see right here. Just another example. We have outside the cell, it's liquid. We have inside the cell, it's liquid. They're both touching these hydrophilic heads. They're happy. And the middle right here, we have our hydrophobic tails. They're not touching any water. They're thrilled. If we do need to move things across said membrane, because they might be important to us, what we're going to use is what's called protein channels. And so that's what we can see right here. All of these proteins are embedded inside of the membrane. So it's essentially like you have a big wall, but somebody puts a door there. Is the door always open? No. Can you open the door and go through it if you want to? Yes. That's what these guys are. They're essentially doors to allow something to come through the cell because sometimes we do need to bring things into the cell. Sometimes we need to get rid of things outside of the cell and we do so using this plasma membrane. Now, some of the different types of plasma membranes that we have is uh, shown basically right here. So the first one is known as a receptor protein. Essentially, it's basically sitting there just waiting for a signal. The signal is this little guy right here. So this is going to come and it's going to sit in that active site, just like the enzyme that we learned about. Once that signal is received, hence, right, receptor proteins, then whatever signal, channel, whatever you're trying to do, it will actually be triggered. So sometimes it's opening of a channel and allowing things to pass forward. Um, you know, sometimes it's closing of a channel. You don't always want a channel open. So again, those are receptor proteins waiting for their signal to come in. Um, next up is a recognition protein. This is really important in your immune system. This is essentially how your body gets an immune system. Once you get sick with something, it sticks a couple receptor proteins on, um, on some of your cells and therefore you can kind of recognize the cell now and say, oh, okay, no, you're good. We've had you before. We know how to take care of you. Like if you get, um, chicken pox, right now you have the receptor protein. So if you're ever exposed again, your body's like, Pfft. We got the signal for this, or we got the receptor for this. We know who you are. You're not going to get us sick this time. We're good. So again, receptor protein is great in your immune system. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's see. Inside of our membrane, we have things like cholesterol. This kind of helps maintain um, the flexibility of it. You don't want a stiff membrane. Remember, this is plasma. It's going to be flowy, squishy animal cells, right? You want things to be able to pass through. Um... What else? So you can see right here, oh, transport proteins. Again, these are really important. Most of the time they are, well, I can't say most of the time. I'd say it depends on what cell you're talking about. Some of the times they are open channels, meaning open and they can just let certain um, molecules pass through. Sometimes they actively need energy. And these are those active transportation stuff that we're going to be talking about. So you would actually have to add energy to this channel protein before things would actually be able to pass through. But we're going to learn all about that when we get to things like photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Uh, next up, we have enzymatic proteins. Again, enzymes help to catalyze reactions. This catalyzing the reactions is going to speed up the reaction and therefore accelerating whatever type of chemi uh, chemical reaction you're trying to move forward. So helps speed it up. All right, so now we are getting into each one of these individual structures or organelles. Okay, so let's start with the first one. This is our cell wall. So when we're talking about a cell wall, again, they're only found in two types of cells, prokaryotic cells and plant cells. Now, prokaryotic cells are prokaryotic cells and plant cells are eukaryotic cells. So not all eukaryotic cells have uh, cell walls, right? Only plant cells do. So keep that in mind. I might also ask you on a test question, what's the difference between plant cells and animal cells? <gasps> Here's your first one. Plant cells have cell walls. Uh, animal cells do not. Boom. So remember that the animal cells are the squishy round ones that if you poke, they go squish, right? Plant cells are the hard, rigid ones that if you poke, they do nothing because of the cell wall. The cell wall basically keeps the rigidity of the plant so that your tree doesn't get a little bit of water loss and just fall over, right? Keeps it nice and, and structured. Also helps uh, for protection. 
right? You don't necessarily want to get eaten if you're a plant cell. You don't want to get eaten if you're any cell. And therefore, this is kind of like a protection against that. Um, it also, oh, uh, allows, um, sorry, does not allow for evaporation of water. Remember, plants are not like us. They can't just go to the water fountain if they're thirsty and take a sip of water. They are at the mercy of whatever water they get, but they need water, water to, to, to live. So if they need the water to live, but they're only at the mercy of whatever water they have in the environment, you need to protect whatever kind of water you have. So this cell wall basically works as kind of like an insulator and helps protect evaporation from happening. You don't want to lose your water, and therefore this prevents that. So great for structure, great for, um, you know, rigidity and protection, great for maintaining water concentrations, not losing any water. Okay, now um, I talked, I wanted to bring up the mitochondria earlier and see like, well, you know, funny that it's kind of the same size as bacteria and here's why. Here's what I was going, here's where I was getting at. Um, there's this thing called an endosymbiont theory and when we we're really trying to figure out where these cells come, came from, remember there's nobody around to go, oh yeah, this cell came from this place. We were just like, I have no idea why there's eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells and they're different. Well, these are theories, and again, we cannot go back and test this because there's, nobody was there for the creation of these cells, so we just believe that this is what happens because of all the evidence that we have. So the endosymbiont theory essentially describes a eukaryotic cell eating a prokaryotic cell sometime back in the day and didn't digest it. It decided to keep it. And this actually kind of makes sense if you think about it because the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell, hopefully you guys remember that from like elementary school, the, the mitochondria essentially is making all of the cells energy. So if you're a little cell and you're going around trying to get energy because that's why you eat things is to get energy, and you're like, hey, I ate this guy, but, you know, he makes energy. Wouldn't it be better for me if I kept him inside me and he could make my energy for me and then I wouldn't have to go out and look for food? I, I, I'm going to do that. And, of course, that's not exactly how it happened. That was a total drama sedation. That was a total reenactment. But, basically, that's essentially what was happening. Is you had a very small prokaryotic cell that was really good at making its own energy. And then here comes this larger eukaryotic cell to come over and it just goes... Oh. That's that endosymbiont. It essentially just engulfed him and then kept him inside and said, you know, make energy for me now. I'm not going to dissolve you and eat you. I'm going to leave you in there. You're going to make energy for me. So what we can see right here and what we believe it happened is here's our little ancient prokaryote. Here's our ancient maybe mitochondria. And this is an ancestral eukaryote. It's like, mm, I'm going to eat you. So that's what he did. He essentially wrapped his plasma membrane. Remember, it's fluid. It moves. It wrapped his plasma membrane around that little prokaryote and brought it inside of him. Now the prokaryote is inside of the eukaryote. Remember, this is an ancestral, ancestral eukaryote. We don't actually know what, organ, what type of organism this was. We just think this is what happened. And then this little prokaryote that was inside the eukaryote then just stayed there and continued to make all of the energy, which kind of makes sense when you look at the mitochondria. So the mitochondria, one, is basically the size of a prokaryotic cell. And you're like, okay, well. Two, it has its own membrane. So it has what's called a double membrane. Why would anything need a double membrane? If you already have a membrane, you're already protected from the outside. Why would you need two? But again, if imagine we wrapped our membrane around this membrane and now there's two. That would kind of make sense why the mitochondria has two membranes. Another one, mitochondria has its own DNA. Wait, separate from the cell? Yes, separate from the cell's DNA. It has its own separate DNA. And the mitochondria replicates its own DNA and it has nothing to do with the cells. So technically, the mitochondria that you guys have inside of you is all your mother's mitochondria. Your father had his mother's, who had her mother's, who had her mother's, who had her mother's, who had her mother's. Her mother's. So essentially, we can go back hundreds of years, if not even thousands of years, and trace what's called um, uh, maternal mitochondrial DNA. That is so cool. But again, another theory why we believe, or another piece of evidence why we believe this endosymbiont theory, because mitochondria is about the same size as a prokaryote, it has a double membrane for some reason, and it has its own DNA and replicates itself. Right? Nothing else inside the cell is going to do that. So pretty cool why we think, again, you ancient eukaryotic cell just ate an old prokaryote. 
Now, there's another theory that, again, we can't really test, but we also believe to happen. It's because we have what's called the endomembrane system. Endo means inside, membrane is membrane, and the system because it all works together. So the endomembrane system is comprised of organelles that are just made of membrane. So it's essentially like you took your plasma membrane on the outside and then just kind of like folded it in on itself. And now you're like, this is my new organelle. And you're like, well, it's just membrane. Yeah, but it works. Okay, that's kind of what we think actually happened. And that's known as invagination. Okay, so we basically had, again, an ancestral eukaryotic cell with its DNA just kind of floating around in there like it would in a bacterial cell or a prokaryotic cell. So then it was like, well, you know what? DNA is kind of important. I'm going to protect it. So I'm going to fold my own membrane in on itself and wrap around the nucleus. And that's what it did. So it started to fold here and it started to wrap around the nucleus. Now the nucleus is the nucleus and it's protected. Hence membrane bound organelles bound in a membrane. Okay. So now it's like, well, I'm protected and that's good. What else can I do with this silly membrane? So it started folding and folding and folding again, and that's what you can actually see right here and here and here. And this became the endoplasmic reticulum, both the smooth and the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So all these are just organelles that are essentially just made of membranes that are working inside of our systems, our, our cells, with these very specialized functions. And we're like, well, where did we even get this? We believe that essentially we just started folding in on ourselves, right, to create these other organelles, and then we went out and ate a prokaryote. And it seems to have worked because look at us. We are so much larger and more impressive than bacteria. Ha <laughs> ha, take that bacteria. All right, so, excuse me, I dropped my clicker. Um, again, that's what we believe happened. These are two theories that we believe are, are happening. And again, we have a ton of evidence. Look at all that evidence. We have nothing to refute it. So again, it's not a theory. It's a theory because we just can't go back and prove it. So. All right, so let's watch this quick animation real quick. And then we will get back to our lecture. The eukaryotic internal membrane system, called the endoplasmic reticulum, and the nuclear envelope may have evolved from infoldings of the plasma membrane in an ancestral prokaryotic cell. Such infoldings are common in modern prokaryotic cells. The theory of endosymbiosis proposes that a critical stage in the evolution of eukaryotic cells involved endosymbiotic relationships with prokaryotic organisms. Microorganisms that live within other cells and perform specific functions for their host cells are called endosymbionts. According to the theory, energy-producing bacteria may have been engulfed by a larger primitive cell and come to reside within it, eventually evolving into what we now know as mitochondria. Photosynthetic bacteria use photosynthetic pigments embedded in internal membranes to derive energy from sunlight. These bacteria may have come to live within early eukaryotic cells, leading to the evolution of pleuroplasts. Several facts provide evidence for the endosymbiotic hypothesis. A few examples include 1. Mitochondria and chloroplasts contain their own circular DNA, similar to DNA in bacteria. 2. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts are surrounded by two membranes. The inner membrane is probably evolved from the plasma membrane of the engulfed prokaryote, while the outer membrane is probably derived from the cell membrane of the host. 3. Mitochondria are about the same size as bacteria. 4. Mitochondria appear to have been derived from purple bacteria and chloroplasts derived from photosynthetic bacteria. All right, guys, so hopefully that kind of helped you visualize what's actually happening in these two endosymbiont and invagination theories. All right, let's talk about the powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondria. Remember, this is the one that we believe got eaten, right? And essentially, that's because it has this double membrane. So it has this inner foldy membrane here, and it also has this outer membrane, which is kind of bizarre. But it is the site of cellular respiration. Um, so we're going to be talking about that in, I believe, two lectures. Um, and this is essentially where we're actually getting all of our cellular energy. I eat that cheeseburger. My cell can't use that cheeseburger. It has to break it down into usable bits of energy. These are known as ATP. Most of them come from this guy right here. In fact, any cell that needs a lot of energy, maybe one that works a lot, 
would have a lot, a lot more mitochondria than maybe cell that doesn't work very hard. So like your liver cell, especially on say January 1st of each year, yeah, I know what you kids are doing on the new year, right? Your liver cells are probably in overdrive because your liver is used for detoxifying your body. So if you've had a heavy night of drinking because you are out celebrating the new year, even if you're under 21, that's illegal, wait till you're 21 and an adult, right? Your liver cells are probably hyperactive. So your mitochondria is working over, uh, uh, over time. And again, that's why in, in, in cells like your liver cells, they're actually going to have thousands of mitochondria per each cell. Right? If your liver is working overload and it needs to so we don't die, right? Then you have to have lots of energy. You get all your energy from the mitochondria. So again, it's about 2,500 mitochondria per liver cell, which is crazy, but super useful. So thank you, mitochondria. Um, what else? That's pretty good. We're going to talk a lot about the mitochondria when it gets cellular aspiration. Now, another one that we kind of think also got eaten in that endosymbiont theory is a chloroplast. Now, chloroplasts are only going to be found in plant cells. Mitochondria are in both. Ribosomes are in both. Um, cell walls are only in plants. Chloroplasts are also only in plants because this is the site of photosynthesis. We're going to get really familiar with this when we talk about photosynthesis in three lectures. So, essentially, it's kind of like a mitochondria weird instead of taking food that we ate and breaking breaking it down into usable bits of energy it's now taking the sunlight and it's turning into usable bits of energy but it also has a double membrane what it also is about the size of bacteria no yes right so again this is and again it's used for energy production so it would make sense that our ancient eukaryotic cells would probably just go eat one of these so now it's making energy for them these ancient plant cells back in the day or at least you know photosynthetic cells so um, this is basically where we're doing photosynthesis again. I'm not really going to get into the inner parts of the chloroplast just yet because we are going to see them in great detail when we get to photosynthesis. So right now all you need to do is recognize this little guy as a chloroplast and the site of, cellular, or, um, the site of photosynthesis. Ah, the bad boy, the nucleus, right? This is kind of thought to be the brain of the cell and it's not. It is not a brain. There is no conscious thoughts happening behind this nucleus but it is responsible for pretty much everything that your cell does and is. Okay, so that's why it's considered the brain. And that's because this stores your genetic information. Remember that my hair is curly because of my DNA that I got from my parents. That DNA is stored here in the nucleus. Okay, so it's going to tell my ribosomes to make a protein that is shaped like this. And that's how I get curly hair or freckles or blue eyes or anything that is you, that makes up you, you. So it's kind of the instructions for making you, you, but actually it's not a brain. Um, so it is engulfed in its own membrane. This is known as the nuclear membrane because it is a nucleus. And on the inside, the very inside, it's called a nucleolus. And this is kind of like a dense area, basically just, uh, I don't know, genetic information. Um, so you guys don't really need to know about all of the parts of this just yet. We are going to see this when we talk about DNA replication coming up. So don't stress, just be able to recognize that this is the nucleus, right? And it stores the genetic information. Now, I do want to point out that there are these little holes right here. These holes are nuclear pores. And that's because RNA gets made in the nucleus and sent out of the nucleus. Remember, the DNA never, never, dude, it's my precious doesn't want to leave the nucleus, but you make a Xerox copy of it and you send it out of the nucleus, that's RNA. Okay, so RNA is going to come out of these little nuclear pores right in here. Same thing with ribosomes and stuff like that. All right, so that endomembrane system that I told you guys about, here's what that is. Remember, endo means inside, membrane is membrane, and system, it all works together. So essentially, this is a system of organelles that are made up of membranes that work together. Okay? Now, what we can see right here is this first part, this bumpy area coming right outside the nucleus. This is known as the endoplasmic reticulum, specifically the rough endoplasmic reticulum, or rough ER, as it's sometimes shortened. Now, this is, again, covered in those little tiny bumps. Those little tiny bumps are ribosomes. Ribosomes are where proteins get made. Okay, so shocker, shocker, the rough endoplasmic reticulum has to do with making proteins. What? No, yes. It is and it does. Now, if we look just on the outside of that, we can see this guy right here, which kind of, to me, looks like some weird coral polyp thing growing out of the ground. The ground to sell. 
Uh, this is known as the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and it is smooth because there are no ribosomes. So it is not having anything to do with protein production, and we're going to learn about what that is in just a second. And then finally, we have what I say the sad stack of pancakes. This is the Golgi apparatus. This is kind of like the mailbox, etc., or the Amazon, right? Everything package-wise comes in and out of this Golgi apparatus. Uh, but let's go into each one of these before I get too much into detail and get ahead of myself. So again, the rough ER, it is considered rough because it is covered in all these little bumps. These little bumps are ribosomes used for protein synthesis. Synthesis just means creation. So we're creating proteins, right? We're making these proteins. Um, and that's pretty much what they're used for. They're manufacturing, so they're making and they're shipping out and packaging these little proteins. So all the proteins that make up you, you probably get started here in the rough ER, packaged and then sent off where they need to go. The smooth ER, again, has nothing to do with proteins, but it does have to do with things like lipids, also for detoxification. So thank you, smooth ER, because you help us on January 1st feel better, right? So any kind of detoxification that you need to do, um, we're making lipids like the phospholipid membranes, other types of lipids like cholesterols and stuff like that, pretty much all get done here in the smooth ER. So protein synthesis is the rough ER, lipid synthesis and packaging is going to be the smooth ER as well as detoxification. So it's a very important for you guys to have here. Um, also things like your liver cell are going to have a ton of smooth ER because again, your liver cells are used for detoxifying your body and therefore very important to have in liver cells. So a lot, a lot, a lot of them. Ah, the sad stack of pancakes, also known as the Golgi apparatus. This is essentially, like I said, the mail room. So anything you want to ship out or receive, you probably need to go through the Golgi apparatus. So the proteins and the lipids that we just made, if we're sending them outside of the cell, first they're going to go here, they're going to get packaged up, and then they're going to get shipped off. Um, so that is what's used for the Golgi apparatus. Now how it does this is essentially it just buds off a little section of it. So imagine, like, I wanted to, I don't know, cut my hair and I cut my hair and then butted off a little piece of my skin and then took the hair with I don't know why I would do that but that's essentially what vesicles do okay so this right here is known as a transport vesicle and any kind of vesicle is going to be used for packaging and transporting so you don't want a protein just floating around in your cell and getting lost somewhere so what you do is you stick it in one of these little pods and these little pods are gonna be like cool you're getting out of our cell I'm gonna take you to the outside of the cell and then I'm gonna release you Sometimes you need to bring things into the cell. Same kind of thing, you're gonna use these little transport vesicles. It's gonna pick something up outside the cell and then bring it in and then take it where it needs to go. Probably the Golgi apparatus. Um, Cause again, used for shipping, packaging, all sorts of important stuff, this Golgi apparatus. All right, so here's how it's a system. So remember we talked about a system and it's working together. Well, here's how that actually works. So say we need to get rid of something or say we need to move something outside the cell. If it's going to be a lipid, it's going to come from the smooth ER. If it's going to be a protein, it's going to come from the rough ER. We send in one of these little transport vesicles here, and we're going to ship it to the mailbox room, okay? So here in the Golgi apparatus, it's going to take it, and it's going to go, cool, your packaging isn't good enough. I'm going to make sure it doesn't break, and it's going to stuff it full of the little, you know, popcorn-y stuff, and it's going to tape it real good. And then it's like, cool, now it's ready to ship across the country. So then it's going to send it again out one of these little vesicles, and it's going to um, basically send the vesicle to the plasma membrane. Now remember, all of these are made out of membrane. So the plasma membrane and this membrane are the same thing. So once the vesicle attaches to the membrane, it kind of just opens up and fuses to it and becomes the membrane. They're not separate. And same thing if I wanted to form one, say this is the outside of my cell membrane, I want to form it, all I'm going to do is butt a little piece of myself and then I'm going to send it to the inside of the cell. Okay, so that's exactly what this ha what this does right here. So if we're moving things into this, sorry, out of the cells, we take it from either the smooth ER, the rough ER, we're gonna send it here to the Golgi body, finally via one of these transport vesicles out to the plasma membrane and then release it outside the cell. Play that in exactly in reverse and you have coming into the cell, right? I need, to, I need this, which is on the outside of the cell, so I'm gonna bud around it. I'm trying to do this backwards here. I'm gonna bud around it right here. There it is, I feel like a weather person. And then I'm going to take that vesicle into my Golgi apparatus, make sure that the product is good, and then I'm going to send it where it needs to go, right? So it can happen either way, either going out of the cell or coming into the cell. Uh, now, lysosomes, let's talk about lysosomes for a second. They are a type of transport vesicle. But in this case, a lysosome or anything to lyse usually means to cut up, to chop up, or 
to destroy. And especially that's what lysosomes are doing. They're like the garbage trucks. So they basically go along and say, oh, you're done with this? Cool, I'm going to take it and get rid of it. Oh, you're done with this? I'm going to take it get rid of it. Get it out of the cell. Get it out of the way. Because the cell does have what's called metabolic waste. It's burning energy and it's moving around and it's doing its little cell thing. It has waste products. You don't want to just let that waste product build up just like you don't in your house. That's why you put it in a little garbage bag and you tie a little knot and you take it to the street and you throw it in the trash can. Right? That's a lysosome. Then the lysosomes are going to be picked up by the trash man and then taken away. They're all kind of like the lysosomes. The trash man and the trash bags. They're all, again, just getting rid of garbage. Um, sometimes inside the lysosomes they have what's called digestive enzymes. And we're going to talk about digestive en enzymes throughout the semester. But essentially, again, enzyme to speed up digestive enzyme to speed up digestive, right? Digestion. You see where I'm going with this? It's essentially going to break down the molecule. So say we're that liver cell and we had a heavy night of, of libations the night before because it's New Year's Eve. And now we have damaged some of our mitochondria. So that mitochondria was like, I can't. Ugh. And the mitochondria is done. We don't want to keep a dead mitochondria inside of your cell. So the lysosome, it would basically pick it up right here and then start to digest it. Anything that can be recycled is going to be recycled. If it's a protein that doesn't work anymore, it's just going to chop up those amino acids and then reuse them. Right? Same thing with the mitochondria. Anything that we can use, we're going to take back, but we're going to recycle. See? Even your cells recycle, guys. It's not that hard for people to recycle. If your little cells with no brains can do it, uh -huh, you can do it. All right, moving on. Uh, another thing that plant cells have that animal cells don't have is this called a vacuole right here. Now, a vacuole is kind of like a big vacant hole. That's how, how I always remembered it in school. Vacant hole, vacuole, right? And that's because it's used for storage. So plant cells have it, animal cells do not. Plant cells use it to store water. They use it to store excess sugar when they're not going to be able to do photosynthesis for a while. If you're a pretty, pretty flower, you're going to store your pigment, right? Your purples and your blues and your pinks and stuff. You're going to store your color in your vacuole, um, as well as, you know, just a variety of other things. So always just kind of used for um, storage. Another thing they use it for is support. So remember, we have the cell wall, the rigid cell wall on the outside. Well, what if this whole area is empty? Like, you know, it's going to kind of want to crash in on itself. So this kind of like acts kind of like a balloon and blows up the inside area and kind of keeps it nice and structurally uh, rigid a little bit. So the reason it's called a central vacuole in a plant cell is because it is usually in the center. In fact, that balloon that blew up like that takes up a lot of space. So usually you can kind of tell where the vacuole is in a plant cell because there's nothing else there. There's not a lot of bunch of chloroplasts and a bunch of other organelles. It's, it's essentially just this big vacant area, hence vacuole or central vacuole. Now, if we are an animal cell, then the cytoskeleton is super important to us. Remember, we're the big squishy one, which could easily just <laughs> collapse and pancake, and that wouldn't be good because we wouldn't be able to function if we pancaked. Okay? So what these guys really need, and plant cells need it too, but really important in animal cells, is a cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton is, cyto means cell, and skeleton is skeleton, so it's an internal structure support system. So now it's going in there going, okay, I got you, I'm going to hold you up so that we don't just fall apart and pancake. Okay, so really important to actually maintain a nice structure so that everything can um, function properly. So that's what this cytoskeleton is actually doing. It's like a you know, structural mechanism kind of thing. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm not gonna show you guys this video real quick, but if you wanna see it, essentially this is an amoeba moving. If you've ever seen an amoeba, it kind of looks like someone picked a booger and flicks it against a wall, it's like right? But they don't have bones, they don't have arms or legs or anything like that. They have what's called pseudopods. And essentially, they just take their cytoskeleton and kind of extend it one way and then grab and then pull themselves over. That's my amoeba walk right there. So that's done with the use of a cytoskeleton. So if you want to see it, please check on this link. Remember, all of these videos are just to kind of help solidify the information that I've given you. And now some of the lectures are a little bit long, so I don't want to necessarily give you guys too much to do. But at your leisure, make sure to watch that video. And here's exactly what it would look like. So inside all of this yellow lines right here, this is the cytoskeleton. So it's essentially been stained a certain color so you can see it. And again, in the video, you'll actually see this little piece of snot. This is the amoeba moving right here and um, using his cytoskeleton to crawl. All right. Uh, we talked a little bit about flagella, right? That long whip-like tail. You can think of, honestly, like a sperm. You guys all know what a sperm looks like. Giggle, giggle, giggle. 
but it has the big round head and the long whip-like tail. That's flagella. So these bacterial cells, these prokaryotic cells can have flagella. Some of our cells have flagella too, like obviously males have sperm cells. What? <sighs> um, but the cousin to flagella is cilia. So flagella would be like essentially one long whip-like tail where cilia would be like lots of little like hair-like little structures that are going to beat in unison. Used for the same thing, used for motion, used to move things along, stuff like that. Like inside of our lungs, we actually have cilia. Inside of our stomach, in our intestines, we have cilia. And this kind of helps just move things along. Um, also really great for absorption, like microvilli, cilia, and stuff like that. Um, so cilia, again, are going to be the short hair-like ones. Flagella, the long whip-like tails. And again, both used for the same thing. Structurally almost identical, just much shorter for cilia, much longer for flagella. So that's what you can see right here. This is a um, human sperm, and we can have the head right here and the long whip-like flagella coming down. Here is cilia on a protist cell or a prokaryotic cell, basically. Um, it's a little bit different, but we're going to talk about the differences between prokaryotics and protists and all this. But you can see the little cilia, those tiny little hairs, all along that cell right there, and again, used for locomotion. And then finally, this would be our cilia lining in our respiratory tract. Um, so usually this one in our lungs is to help catch any little foreign antibody before it actually gets into our system. So the cilia will catch them and then they'll get digested by things and, and removed so that we don't get sick, especially when we talk about fungus spores. You're going to thank your cilia. All right, quick overview of what we've seen so far. So we have animal cells and plant cells right here. Nucleus, yes, has in, are, are found in both plant and animal cells. So is the cytoskeleton, plant and animal cells. Uh, the mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell, absolutely found in both cells. Lysosomes found in both cells. The rough ER, remember where you're actually making your proteins, absolutely found in um, both of them. Uh, what else? The smooth ER, again, where you're going to be synthesizing those lipids and stuff like that. Detoxification, yes, both. Uh, the Golgi apparatus, that mailroom, packaging and sending, um, you know, the... The proteins and the lipids and everything that you're making and burning in and out of your cells comes through the Golgi apparatus. The cell wall, only found in animal cells, right? Sorry, <laughs> only found in plant cells, not in animal cells. So animal cells are the only ones who don't have it. Um, prokaryotic cells, bacteria, they do have cell walls. So do plant cells. Animal cells, again, the only ones who do not have them. <coughs> Excuse me, vacuoles. Sometimes found in animal cells, again, used for storage and stuff like that. Absolutely found in plant cells, for sure. And used, again, for storage and stuff. Chloroplast, not found in animal cells, only found in plant cells. The site of photosynthesis. That makes sense, because we can't do photosynthesis. Bummer, right? But, you know, cheeseburgers are good. So, this is a really great chart to help you study. And remember, I could always ask you the difference between plants and animal cells. I could always ask you the difference between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Any of these could easily be test questions on your upcoming exam. No, I'm not having a Tourette's or, you know, stroke. That's my winking at you going, yeah, it will be on your test. Um, so again, really, really useful, these charts right here, and studying and make sure that you guys understand both identification-wise and function-wise what's going on with each, of these, um, with each of these organelles. With that, I will take a selfie. No? Okay. And I will say thank you guys so much for joining me for another lecture, and I will see you very shortly for um, the rest of, of all of our semester. Aren't you guys so excited? This is only lecture number four. You have so many more to go. But you can do this, guys. You can do this. Take your time. Pause the videos if you need to. Go at your own pace. Just don't get behind. All right, guys. I'll see you soon. Have a great week.